Okay, we've just described bonds in terms of interatomic forces. You've got your attractive force because opposites attract, and then you've got your repulsive force because those electron shells can't overlap without bumping things up to a higher level. That's a big repulsive force. Now let's think about it in terms of energy, right? Well, the first question is, how is energy related to force? Do you remember this? In physics, you would have learned about this. We remember that E, energy, so energy is equal to the integral of force over the distance over which that force is applied, right? So if you integrated, like our net force here, if you started here and you integrated all the way out to there, what would that tell you? That would be the area under this curve, right? That's what that energy would be. And what does that energy correspond to in the real world? Well, you're starting at the equilibrium bond length, so if you just leave this thing alone, the atoms are going to be some distance apart, right? And they're going to stay there. What this is telling you is that you have to apply a force. You have to apply this force, which changes over time. It increases at first, and then it decreases. But you have to keep on applying that force as you pull these things apart until you pull them infinitely far away, and you have broken that bond. So you could integrate from here, from r naught all the way to infinity, and it would tell you the bond strength. How cool is that? That's way cool. So um, that, that, that's the value of thinking this in terms of energy, because energy is something that's more useful than forces, I think. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and draw this in terms of energy instead of in terms of force. So we're going to draw our axes again. So we've got our y-axis and our x-axis. Remember, this is the x-axis, r, that's the interatomic distance. interatomic distance, okay? And then now we're going to have energy. Instead of force, we're going to have energy over there. So you can have higher energy systems or lower energy systems, right? And we know that things are going to move towards lower energy. The whole universe goes towards lower energy. So we know that energy is the integral of force. Or in other words, if you took the derivative of energy, dE, dR, you would have force. Okay, if you took the derivative of it. So if we took the derivative of energy and that's equal to force, what do we know about maximums and mins, right? The zero of the derivative must have been a max or a min of energy, right? So how do we know which one it is? Well, we can look at the curve, right? Here it's descending, right? Because it would be descending because this was a negative number below from zero up until R naught. Since the force is negative, that means that the energy curve would have been decreasing. And then over here, since it's positive, it means it would be increasing. Therefore, it must have been a minimum, not a maximum. So at this r naught value right here, r naught right there, we know that we can draw a minimum. Right? So here is our, that is energy. Okay? So at the very bottom of this curve, the minimum there, that would be the place where we had a zero right here in our force diagram. Make sense? Because of our definitions that we learned in calculus, okay? So we can now apply some numbers to this, right? We can call this point the bottom of that well E naught, and that is our binding energy. E naught is the binding energy. What do we mean by that? It's exactly what I said before. It's the work that must be done to take it from its equilibrium position and pull these things far and far apart. Remember, and the, the force changes over time. It's changing like Fn, right? Um, but it's going to change over time. So this is just equal to that force. If you start out here at a low energy, as you pull these things further and further and further away, eventually it will reach up to here zero. So this distance between zero and E naught, that's your binding energy. It's how tightly things are held apart. And not all bonds are held apart or held together at the same strength. Some are really strong bonds and some can be broken really uh, easily, right? So there's weak bonding and strong bonding and we're going to characterize those in just a minute. Um, really quick though, let's talk about what do the general things look like for different materials. Let's imagine that the gray curve represents a ceramic, okay? So let's say that this is um, a ceramic. What do we know about ceramics? Well, you know that they are high melting because you could take a mug, 
like this bodacious mustache mug, right? And uh, you could put it in a furnace, and it would probably not melt, but a polymer, right? If I took something made out of plastic, like this equally bodacious Noosa container that I used to paint with, um, it would melt, okay? And then you could take a metal, and it would be somewhere in the middle, right? You could take a pocket knife, and it would melt somewhere between the polymer and the ceramic. So therefore, the ceramic must be the most tightly bound, right? It must be the strongest bond because it doesn't melt the easiest, right? Therefore, uh, it would have the deepest E naught, right? It has the lowest value of E naught. We think that a polymer and a metal would probably have less. So what might they look like? The polymer is the weakest one. It's the one that melts the easiest. So it's going to have a really shallow curve. It might look something like this. Okay, so that's our polymer. And when I say polymer, that's just the material science word for plastic, which you've probably been using your whole life. Polymer and plastic, same thing. We just call them polymers um, instead of plastics. So where would a metal uh, go? It's going to be in between those two. Might look something like that. Okay, so all of a sudden using these what are called potential well diagrams because it looks like a well like it goes up then down looks like a well these potential well diagrams start to tell us lots of useful information about materials okay so let's give you an expression for energy this overall net energy we'd like an expression for it here's the expression that we're going to use the net energy remember because net energy comes from attractive and repulsive energies in the same way that net force comes from attractive and repulsive forces. We could think of these in terms of energy as well. So the attractive energy, remember we're going to do negative because attractive means lowering energy, right? A negative energy going down in energy is favorable. So it's going to be negative, our attractive value. It's going to be negative A over R to the M. And then we're going to add to that the repulsive term, which is B over R to the N. So what are these different variables? A, B, M, and N are fitting constants, basically. Now, A we can calculate, and we can do a pretty good job of estimating what A will be because we know what the attractive force should be, right? We said the attractive force is equal to all of this stuff, right, over R squared. So we know what the attractive energy should look like. It should look like the... Uh, we take the derivative of this, we should get this, okay? So if you take the integral of this, you should get that. So A looks as follows. A should be equal to, we're going to call it, uh, I'm going to use capital Z for my charges. Z1, that's the charge of the atom number one. Then you're going to have Z2, that's the charge of atom number two. Instead of putting these in parentheses, let's go ahead and put those in absolute uh, value straight lines, right? Because we want the absolute value, okay? And then we're going to multiply that times the charge of an electron squared because they, those are given in charges. We want to square that. And then we're going to divide this by 4 pi epsilon naught. And we already showed you what epsilon naught was up here. It was 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12 farads per meter. Okay, so that is a pretty good estimate for A. So let's say you had this material. You had sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. What do we know about sodium chloride? What's the charge of sodium and chlorine? Well, if you don't remember, you can always check. You can come over here to your handy-dandy periodic table and take a look at where they are. Where they are will tell you pretty much where, what you need to know. Sodium's right here. So what charge will it have? We learned about this last uh, couple of videos ago. It's going to lose one electron to look like a noble gas, right? When it loses one electron, sodium all of a sudden looks like neon, and that's going to make it really happy. Meanwhile, chlorine, if it gains one electron, it's going to look like argon. So sodium is going to be plus one because it's going to lose an electron, making it positive. Chlorine is going to gain an electron, making it negatively charged by one. So if you were to calculate A for those, this would be plus 1 and minus 1. So you'd plug in 1 and 1, multiply that by the charge of an electron, which is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Q equals 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, right? So a tiny little charge. 
uh, you square that, and that would be the approximate value for A for the attractive energy term of sodium chloride. Whereas if you did, let's say, magnesium oxide, magnesium oxide, if you look at this one, what should it be? Well, magnesium is a group 2 metal, so it's probably going to lose 1, 2 electrons and become 2 plus. And sure enough, that's the only charge you'll ever find it in. And we've said before that oxygen is always 2 minus. So instead of being the same as that, this one's going to be plus 2 and minus 2. So you'll plug in 2 and 2. It has a stronger attractive energy. That makes sense. It's a bigger charge, right? A more positive, more negative. They're going to be more attracted than less positive and less negative, right? Only makes sense. B is going to be a constant that you just fit. You can't, there's not a good fudge factor for predicting B in this class. M and N, well, what should M and N be? M has to be 1, because if we integrate this, we have to get something that has R squared. So M is going to be equal to 1. M is going to be equal 1, and N is a fitting parameter, right? It's it's for fitting. So it's typically a large number, like 6 to 8 or 9, um, but it's a fitting parameter. So it'll depend. Right? All we're doing is we're taking real live data. In the real world, the energy curves do look kind of like this. And so all we're doing is we're plugging in values for A, M, B, and N that event essentially fit this, this curve. We're doing some curve fitting. Okay? So why go through all this trouble? I mean, it's clever, but why do we bother? Let's talk about that in the next video.